Yes. Gosh, I paint powerful. his portrait. Really? Col- Colby's. In fact, I'll I'll be painting it tomorrow. Um, I'll be painting it for the kids. Yeah, you're going to be giving a talk at the Highland School to the kids, yeah. and then you're going to be doing one for the adults. Yes. Uh, tomorrow evening, a formation yeah. night. Have you ever done Kobe and Colbe together? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Saint I have Max not. St. Maximilian Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> What's, it, what's his, uh, they call him the, the viper, the, what do they call oh, him? The, the, mamba? the mamba? Mamba, <laughs> mamba, yeah, mamba. Saint Maximilian Mamba. <laughs> uh, I don't, I think this is blasphemous now. Yeah, pro- well. <laughs> no, for Colby. Colby's a patron saint of our show. In fact, yeah. here's a little statue, Colby. Oh, look at right that. Here. We don't have the dunking Colby, we have the, uh, the monking. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. Are you so. kidding me? This is the Beatitudes. We are a big deal. We got <laughs> <laughs> at least to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> We're a big deal at a tiny table. That's and it. This is the number one podcast for men at a tiny table with three hosts in the world. Yup. So uh, if this is your first time to experience us or you have been back for many repeat punch cards, the Beatitudes is a show for Christian men walking together in holiness and humorness as we grow closer to the Lord, but also as we challenge ourselves, right? Finding faith in the mundane, remembering that fraternity is one of the ways that we get to experience the living Christ, and also getting to peel back the layers with amazing guests. But before we meet the guests, let's meet ourselves. <laughs> introducing. <laughs> me, I'm Jeff Shufflebein. <laughs> and uh, introducing. Nick. That's me. And. Introducing. Paul. That's me. You got all three now, and that's Jeff, Nick, and Paul. We got four-letter names, and we're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I never even connected those dots. <laughs> we do all have four letter names. Except for it's Nicholas, Jeffrey, and Polonius. So That's true. <laughs> yes, as we discovered on a previous episode. Mom, how come you never told me? <laughs> Previously on the Beatitudes. Paul uncovers the family toga and crest. Polonius. <laughs> Toga, toga. I like the family toga. It's, <laughs> it's just, just the one. <laughs> that was the one that my parents put us in when they wanted us to like get along. It was the get along toga. So like the old snuggy, it became the snoga. The which was snoga. <laughs> <laughs> oh That's when you're doing yoga outside. <laughs> right now, anyway. In the, in the snow. <laughs> I gotta snow. say this. When we were... <laughs> Look at him. This is unbelievable. Uh, so New Year's Eve party, friends are like, hey, what's the thing that your family did? This is like conversation started. Oh, no. Th- the thing that your family did that you didn't realize was, was so weird <laughs> until you got to college and you told somebody and they're like, that's not normal. Yeah. Wait, what was it? So a friend of ours, a friend of ours uh, did family showers God. for far too long. Oh, oh no. Gosh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought this was going to be on Snoogies or whatever they're called. <laughs> but just the family toga. Sno- the snoga. Rap, the, the being so close wow. all together. All right. Well, that's wow. uncomfortable. <laughs> so let's transition <laughs> from that. So from that, our guest. No. <laughs> hey, I got to tell you. <laughs> you got no, fun. you go for it. <laughs> I am lost right now. You know, maybe part of what you're hearing come out of this is that the three Beatitudes are in the middle of Exodus 90 if you've ever participated in faith fraternity, which we're into that kind of stuff, and also asceticism, which is, oh, I'm sorry, prayer, asceticism, and fraternity. Asceticism, deny yourself TV, deny yourself social media, deny yourself food, deny yourself Al- showers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alcohol, video games. Oh, yeah, alcohol. Scrolling on your phone. Yeah. Like, and they're basically, watching YouTube. they're really trying to get you to go into the desert. I've taught my dog to scroll on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Lick. <laughs> That's I have not scrolled at all. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> you, you know, you and the Pharisees might get along on some things. Well, if I told you I took cold showers, then you should condemn me. Because oh. <laughs> that's a lie. I'm sorry, Exodus team. It is my one and only part. <laughs> that's okay. actually, well, so I'll, I'll admit, though, that there are parts of it, like some of the smaller things. I, I say smaller. I mean in the sense that they can consume small moments They're of your day. They're beneath you. No, no, no. No, but like scrolling on your phone can happen for like five minutes or whatever, and they can, that can show up here and there throughout the day. I'm not always good about avoiding that, but, yeah. but the dedicated moment of, oh, well, this is where I take my cold shower for the day. Mm-hmm. 
that's the one that I know that I can do, even though I hate doing it. But it's like, all right, I can carve that time out and make sure that I do it. Do the thing. Yeah. yeah. So there are pieces of this that I'm still very much trying to uh, bring into my life. But well, I think that's part of it too, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, they said gradually to introduce. And there's going to be pieces that you're going to fail, and like, yeah, don't let what is it? Don't they said we were meeting on Saturdays? Like, don't let the devil win twice like knock you down and keep you down yeah like, you're gonna get knocked down but like sure get back up That's so it was so good. super cold in texas yesterday and i took two warm showers <laughs> <laughs> well, the second one's not even like a shower for the day that's like can i take a warm bubble bath like that's separate from my shower for the day it's just like wow. an activity <laughs> let's get into technicalities yeah i think that's what it's about <laughs> that's what the lord was always about <laughs> All right. Well, listen, we have literally an incredible guest who um, I can't wait for you all to meet this man. I've seen him on stage a few times. We became friends. There's so many amazing things we're going to uncover here on the show. And if I'm not mistaken, Tom Verano, who's on the show, is a fan of the Beatitudes, right? Absolutely. That's your ticket in. Absolutely is the right (laughs) word. (laughs) That's all we ask. Tom, before we get to know about you, let's know about us. What is your favorite episode that you can recall? (laughs) Maybe a guest that you can recall really enjoying for the new listener who wants to go (laughs) back. (laughs) <laughs> what about what about us? We're gonna get to Tom. <laughs> I know, but hey, let's flip the script. What do you think about us? Hey, he likes to flip it around. Go ahead, Tom. That's fair. That's fair. I, you know, I was actually talking to Paul before uh, we came on here, and who was the gentleman that that I had mentioned that I appreciated? Steve that? Lemire. Yeah. Te- you texted me. Yeah. On the, you texted mm. me on that. I one. was actually in an airport um, flying from New York back to Texas. And I heard that particular podcast, and it resonated with me. Mm. And I just had to reach out to you, Jeff. I mean, I was like, wow, you guys, I mean, first of all, your studio looks (laughs) looks a lot bigger than what we're sitting in right now. (laughs) 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 You're used to huge Camera (laughs) camera magic. It's a glorified broom cupboard. But anyway, the the actual show was so powerful. And... So that was one of my favorites, actually, because it that's a it's actually person. got me in this seat. Yeah. That's the second oh. person today. That's awesome. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Well, yeah. let's uh, let's let's now make this your show. This is uh, you are a guest, and we're happy to have you here, Tom Verano. The name of your business today, just and people are like, who is this guy? <coughs> what am I talking about here? Sure. Emotion. No art. Yeah. Emotion into art. Emotion into art. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Because I keep thinking about yeah. art leading to emotion. It's emotion mm. into art. Yes. Mm. I knew that. Yeah. Um, we want to know about you. Where did you come from? What's your story? How all of a sudden are you on stages all over doing your thing? Yeah. Well, and the mic's all yours. We're yeah. going to shut up now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we are capable. Ish. Um, you know, born and raised in upstate New York, uh, Rome, New York, actually, Syracuse area, and cradle Catholic. Um, pretty crazy household born into um a lot of i mean i don't we could probably get right into it sure, here, go I guess. For it. so you know just grew up in a pretty intense environment a lot of physical abuse and you know um verbal abuse sexual abuse um but on the flip side just had an amazing relationship with my father i mean he was he was my hero but on the other side he's you know, doing all these other things in the house. So it's a lot of confusion. But um, we'll talk about that. I want to I get into sure. some of that. Um, but fast forward, fell in love with photography, fell in love with, you know, being a portrait photographer and went to college for that. A um, couple years in, realized I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I wanted to be a portrait photographer. I wanted to change people's lives with them looking at a photograph of themselves, like, wow, I am beautiful. Look at look at this portrait of me and mm. see themselves as God sees them, you know. Mm. And um, so went to my father. I said, Dad, I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. He said, what's that? I said, I want to be a portrait photographer. He said, what do we need to do? I said, well, I need a studio. He said, look, it's only you and I living here. He said, let's, uh, let's start it. Two rooms down the house down the hall you Mm. have two of those bedrooms one is going to be your office one's a shoot room 
And our home telephone number is going to be your business number. You're in business. And there I was, 19 years old, completely and utterly broke, but in business, following my dream, my passion. And um, it was in college. I will back up a little bit. It was in college that one of the professors said, go to any church and photograph the interior of a church and then report back with what you and I wasn't going to church at the time. I was hurt in the church um, as a altar boy, um, you know, basically sexual abuse through a priest. Yeah. And um, so I didn't want anything to do with the church. So I literally walked away from the church. But it, going back to that moment where this professor said, go to a church, I literally had to use a phone book <laughs> back then. There was no Internet. So I used a phone book and found a church, called the church. Priest said, come on down, absolutely. Wednesday night, put on some music, soft lighting. It it was a gorgeous church. It looked like a a cathedral. And I went in there. I was by myself, and he left me alone, and I went to the Stations of the Cross, and I literally photographed every Station of the Cross. Mm -hmm. And I got to the crucifix at the very end, this massive crucifix, and something broke in me. It was the Holy Spirit that literally broke me as a man. And I literally was on my knees and I was weeping. And my life was completely changed that night. I, I never looked back. I all the all the sin, all the 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 shame, <clears throat> all the guilt, all the trying to fill this hole in my heart from the abuse, from the childhood abuse to the sexual abuse. All of it was completely wiped away that night, and I'm weeping. And I remember I left the church, and I went home, and I found the movie The Greatest Story Ever Told, Mm -hmm. a three-hour saga movie. And I watched that by myself, weeping again. Now I'm seeing the physical attributes of what Christ did for us, and I'm weeping and so the next day I called the church, and I, I Father Hearn, Philip Hearn was, is his name, and I said, I need to tell you what happened last night. I had an unbelievable experience, and he said, tell me. And he said, in fact, come on down to the church. So I, came, I went back to the church, sitting in his office, and I told him the whole story, and he said, stop right there. He said, I need you to be our sixth grade religion teacher. I said, well, I said, wait a minute. I said, well, I said, I don't go to church. I'm not even in church anymore. He goes, it doesn't matter. He goes, I want you to be our sixth grade religion teacher. And that moment, for the first time in a long time, somebody actually saw me yeah. and poured into my life. And I had to dive into the scriptures because I was now teaching these kids. I'll do it. And I was telling you about the cathedral-looking church. It was absolutely gorgeous. Sun, uh, the, the services for the, the kids was in the evening, and I would take them up into the church, dark church, turn on the lights for them. I'd put them at the podium where all the grown-ups stood, and I allowed them to read from the scriptures in this gorgeous setting, in this place that was only set aside for holy people and grown-ups. And now they're there. And these kids came to life. I mean, hmm. they were seen and they were brought up. And um, anyway, I, I, I can keep going, but the Beatitudes have no further comments. This is all Tom, <laughs> brothers. You, great, you're flooring I, I, us, and I think that there's um, great vulnerability and love and compassion in this. So we just want you to roll. Amen. Um, well, anyway, years later, I would see some of these students out now i'm a photographer i run my own portrait studio that little studio in my father's home exploded i literally hundreds and hundreds of people came to his home he'd be sitting in the barca lounge italian dude my father (laughs) he'd be sitting in the barca lounge watching tv flipping through the channels and kids would knock on the door coming to get senior portraits hundreds of them and so finally i had to move the studio to an actual location and fast forward um my life again was completely changed i'm i'm photographing now i'm running the portrait studio full-time i'm doing high school senior portraits weddings 
and this is about to blow your mind. This is how God works in our life, okay? He sees us. God sees us completely exposed. He sees our heart. He sees what we're going through. Sometimes our prayers to him are our emotions. That's why I named the company Emotion Into Art because sometimes that's all we have is our emotions. Us weeping. You know, Jesus wept. He had compassion. He wept. You know what I mean? He, he, he gave us these emotions for a reason. So I'm, I'm literally struggling in the business financially. I loved what I was doing, but I, you know, wasn't a businessman. I mean, so one day at church, now I wasn't, let me back up. I, I'm going to the Catholic Church. I'm teaching at the Catholic Church. And so a friend came over, some friends of mine came over and to my house and they're like, Tom, I see you going to church, and, you know, how's it all going? And I said, it's it's going great. I said, I love it. You know, I'm teaching. And they said, you know, what about your Bible? Are you, you know, are you reading through the Bible? I said, yeah. I'm, he said, you know, this one guy said, you should come over to our church, check out our church. And said, I, yeah, I'd love to. Anything with God or church, you know. So, so I went to their church, non-denominational church. And there's music. And it's exciting, and there's, you know, people jumping up and down. There's clapping, and, you know, it was was like a party, you know. So I was like, oh, my gosh, this is, talk about emotion. That's all it was, was emotion, you know. So I went back, and I was like, I need to be here. I need, need, something resonated with me. I I needed to be here. (laughs) And so I went back to talk with Father Hearn. And I, I called a meeting with him in his office. I'll never forget it. And I said, Father Hearn, I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to go to this other church. They have, you know, they, they, they teach me how to open the Bible. They, they taught me how to tithe. They, they, they're teaching me how to tithe, you know. And, and um, you know, we never talked about that. And he's like, Tommy, you give what you can. You know, you don't, there's no set amount. You give what you can. And I said, yeah, I said, I really feel like I need to go in this direction. He said, he said, I understand. And he he released me, you know, just as like a a father would release a son, just, okay, go. And so I went and fast forward. Now I'm struggling in the business. I'm, I'm trying to make ends meet. And one day I'm in church at this new church. And in the beginning of service, they would have a a basket that came around. You know, you put your money in the basket. Tithes and offerings, they call it. And here it comes. And I had nothing in my pocket to give. I had nothing to put in the basket. So I remember I'm looking down at my, my hand, and I had a beautiful gold nugget ring that my aunt had given a prized possession. She had been deceased. She's deceased now. And I just had this ring. It was a, a gift. And I remember without telling my wife who's on my right or a friend of mine who's on my left, I took the ring off. And as the basket came through, I tossed it in the basket. That's all I had. I said, Lord, this is it. And the, and the basket went by. That was a, a Wednesday night. Come Saturday, I'm photographing a wedding and having a great time. hundred people at the reception were having a blast. And I knew to, to do two things at the wedding. Dress the part so I wore a tuxedo. And use my God-given energy to make people feel really good about themselves. So when I smiled, they smiled. When I used my energy, they used their energy. And we were having a blast. And this gentleman comes up to me in the middle of this reception. And I have my camera, my gear. And he said, Tom, he said, uh, young man, he said, is, is this your business? And I said, yeah, I, I started this a few years. He goes, you love what you do, don't you? And I said, I absolutely love what, what I do. I mean, he goes, I could tell. that People are having a blast here. And uh, then his wife interrupted, and she said, what's going on here? I met her. Her name is Sue, and his name was Lee. And um, he said, look, Tom, he goes, um, I see something in you that I don't normally see. Um, I want to invest in you, he says to me. And I said, well, <laughs> he goes, do you have a business card? And I said, I reached in my pocket, gave him a card. He gave me his card. And he said, I'm going to be in touch. You need to get back to work. Go go back to work. He said, I'll be in touch with you. And we separated. We went our own separate ways. I went back to work. Towards the end of the night, I was looking for him. He had left early, so I couldn't find him. 
that was a Saturday night. Come Monday, I'm at my desk. Now I have my own portrait studio. We're renting a little apartment, and I have uh, my own portrait studio. And the phone rings, and it's this gentleman, Lee, on the phone. Well, I met at the wedding. And uh, he said, Tom, do you remember me? And I said, yeah. I said, I was looking for you at the end of the wedding. I said, I wanted to ask you a question. He goes, what was your question? You said you wanted to invest in me. I said, I don't under, do you want to own part of my business? And he, he laughed. He goes, no, I don't need to own any part of your business. He said, I manage $29 billion in New York City, and I don't need any part of your business. <laughs> so, he, you know, I was, it was silent. And then when I started talking, I started calling him sir. I said, sir, what is it that you want? <laughs> you know, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, and he's like, he's like, I want to own a piece of your passion. I see your passion for people. I want to own a piece of that. And I said, I don't understand. He said, look, Tom, I don't see myself being in the Utica, Rome, upstate New York area anytime soon. He said, why don't you come down to Manhattan and I'll explain everything to you then. And there was silence on the phone because that was me thinking this stranger wants to get me to New York City and slice my neck open (laughs) and throw me in some alley. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, get a piece of that energy. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, yeah, exactly. So... I, I, you know, I said, Lee, I said, I, I, I don't even know what to say. I said, do you mind if I talk to my father and, and then get back to you? Because absolutely, he was all energetic. He said, absolutely, go talk to your father and then call me back. So get off the phone with him. I race to my father's house, you know, drive over there. My father's living alone now. Old time Italian screamer guy. Did you ever meet <laughs> these kind of Italians? They scream. They don't talk. They scream. That was my dad. He's living alone in this big house by himself. I entered the house. I said, Dad, you're never going to believe this. This is Monday. I said, Saturday, I'm photographing a wedding. And this gentleman comes up to me, says he wants to invest in me. And now I don't know what to do. I, he wants me to go to New York City. And my dad screams at me. He goes, go see the guy. Where's your faith? You're in church twice a week, Tom. Go see what he has to say. He's not going to hurt you. He actually said he's not the Don. He's not going to he's not going to hurt you. My dad talked Italian <laughs> phrases all the time. He's not going to hurt you. So, you know, whenever you have that that vigor, that passion that your family or friends have for you, it gives you more of yeah. it. I mm-hmm. had that. So, I raced back to my studio. Back to my excuse me, my studio. And I get Lee on the phone. And I said, Lee, I have great news. I said, my dad said I could come and see you. (laughs) And he started laughing just like that. He said, that is great news. He said, but wait a minute. He said, before you come and see me, I need you to do something for me. And I'm thinking, here's the catch. There's always a catch, right? He said, I need you to write down in written form everything about you said you're newly married. I want to know about your new marriage. You said you just started the business. I want to know about. He said you, you talked about your faith. I want to know about. I want to know about all your bills. I want to know everything. Can you do that? And I started laughing. I said, I've never done that before, but I could certainly give it a shot. He said, Good. And I said, Lee, I have a question for you. I said, Can I bring a friend? You know, because I've never been to the city. And I'm thinking adventure, New York City, investor. I have no idea what this. He said, absolutely. Now, there's no internet back then. No e-ticketing. So Lee had to FedEx us two round trip it, tri- uh, tickets to Midtown Manhattan. Two round uh, tickets, round trip tickets. Wow. So we get to Midtown Manhattan. We, we leave Syracuse, fly into LaGuardia. And uh, we look up 605 Third Avenue, Midtown Manhattan, New Burger and Berman. Look up, all glass building, 40th floor, leaves on the 40th floor. We get up there, take the elevator. The doors open at the 40th floor. There's Lee standing there. He shakes our hand. He was a huge guy. When he shook your hand, your whole body shook. <laughs> he was this massive guy. And he goes, boys, follow me. We follow him down this long corridor, then down this long hallway. And we get to the end, and there's his corner office. Massive corner office all glass floor to ceiling glass looking out over manhattan empire state building right there twin towers right in the back and i remember i'm just pressed up against the windows people were this small they're tiny just looking and then lee woke us from our day my daydream and he said boys come and sit down at my desk we sit down at his desk he goes around to his side he leans over the desk points at me 
and says, Tom, tell me about your life. And I proceeded to tell him about my new marriage, my business. He stood up and said, stop right there. I have to invest in you. Something's telling me I have to invest in you. Did you bring those obligations I asked you to bring, he asked me. And I said, yeah, I have the envelope right here. I hand it to him. He pulls everything out, spreads it all over his desk. My whole life story is on his desk in written form. All my bills, everything. And he sits down and opens up his desk drawer, takes out a checkbook, and starts writing out checks to every one of my debts that day. I was 26, 23 years old, 23 years old. And I remember I got so nervous. I was literally shaking. I got up and went to his side of the desk as he's writing out the checks, and I grabbed him by the wrist. And I said, Lee, I said, I appreciate this. I said, but I can't pay you this back. I don't have these kind of funds. He said, this isn't about you paying this back. This is about you doing this for somebody in the future. It has nothing to do with you paying this back. (laughs) And then I said, Lee, but, but I'm a photographer. I don't, I can't do this for somebody. He said, this isn't about the money. This is about you doing good for other people. It has nothing to do with the money. And then he wrote me a check for 26000 He said, get that business off the ground. I see your passion for people. And then he wrote me a check for 22000 And he said, you're, you're servicing brides, aren't you? Go buy yourself a new vehicle. He said, be on time. Go start your life, he says to me. For the next four years, Lee Eidelman, 605 Third Avenue, Midtown Manhattan, Newburger and Berman, flew me to New York City every single month just to have lunch with me. <laughs> just to have lunch what? with me. Incredible. And it took me all day of travel between delays, between sure. cab, cab rides, all of it, just to get to New York, to get to his office. His secretary would let me in, and we would have the same routine. We'd shake hands, and we'd go check the weather of the city by looking out over Manhattan and checking the Twin Towers. And if it was a beautiful day, you could see miles down the Hudson. And if it was a cloudy day, just the tips of the towers would be sticking out. And um, then we would make our way to the elevator to go find some lunch. As soon as we got in the elevator, the lessons would start. The doors would close. There'd be other business people in the elevator with us wanting his attention, wanting his time. And he would softly put them aside because he was with me. (laughs) We'd get to ground level looking for a cafe or a restaurant. Business people would approach him. And he would softly put them aside because he was with me. And I got my first lesson from Lee Eidelman. Wherever he was, he was present. He was in that moment. You and I, we're all guilty of it at this table. We're missing heartbeats of people we care about because we're not always in the moment. And Lee taught me that, to be in the moment of our lives. If we're with somebody, put the phones down. We only have so many heartbeats. And that's it. That's it. So this, for the next four years, that's what my life consisted of. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there for a minute. Um, okay. <laughs> 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 what? Where, where, where do we go? I have a question. <laughs> this was all on the literal heels of you putting your treasured ring into the collection basket. Yes. Yes. And... That was like an act of tithing and service and love for Christ. Like this was an outpouring of what you had. You gave what you could moment. And what you got then from Lee is something that you could have never predicted that is, I'm not trying to compare anything he did to a ring or vice versa. But the message in in the ring is that you give what you can. It's like what Lee was telling you. Yes. What happened with Lee? What is the story? So is he still with us? I'll... Well, let me say this. Three years, there's so many messages within this. But three years after Lee retired, he passed away from cancer. Sure. So the big American dream to retire, f- me personally, Tom Verano, I think it's a big lie. I think we need to be in the moments of our life. I mean, obviously plan and, and think of our futures and be responsible. But don't make that your end all, yeah. because it's not. We, we don't. We're not promised tomorrow. We we have to live today, and be here today. And as far as the ring goes, seven years to the date that I threw that ring in that basket, 
the pastor of that church asked me to give my, they call it testimony, and I went up and spoke to the, the congregation. I told this story that I just told you. You know, all my bills were paid that day. My wife's student loan, everything was paid that day. And I told that whole story, and at the end, the pastor said, stop right there. And he went in his office and came out, and he had my ring. <laughs> and he handed it back to me. And he said, During a testimony. During the, he said, we found this in the church basket. We didn't know whose it was. And he gave it back to me, and I still own that ring. <laughs> and oh, my God. Yeah, that's God, – God was speaking to me. And he, he literally said to me, you can never – and this is for anybody that's listening. You can never outgive me. You can never outgive me because I'll do above and beyond what you can ever imagine. And that's, it's so powerful for all of us. And by the way, um, I have a couple gifts here for you guys. <laughs> Speaking oh, of giving. Oh, right? yeah. I, I wrote all this down in a book. And um, it's uh, called from, from the Pit to the Palace. And um, it's stories of overcoming the odds. I mean, it's it's from... The sexual abuse from, you know, that whole drama and saga, um, the physical abuse at the house, um, you know, um, you know, getting getting to know this Lord that we call Savior, that's in there, and it's so powerful. And uh, I talk about faith and trust and, and um, just how we can grow with God, you know. I mean, this is such an amazing journey that we all have and have the opportunity to do. Um, to be his, you know, it's called From the Pit to the Palace, and uh, they can find it on my website, emotionintoart.com, or on uh, on Amazon, so. Wow. Amazing. Wow. It's so funny, because hearing <laughs> your story, and, uh, you know, my overgeneralization, rich man takes young artist under his belt and gives him life lessons, reminds me of the book The Go-Giver. yes. Yes. And you're like, this doesn't happen. Yes. But it's yes. really, it's a neat narrative. <laughs> right. It doesn't happen. <laughs> yes. Sounds like a nice little parable. Except for here's the real go giver. Yeah. Um, Amen. Incredible. You know, the thing you said about like the chasing the American dream. Uh, I know this is a different version of that story. I think I'm almost the exact same age from birth as Kobe Bryant. We had four kids when he died. Our oldest was almost the exact same age. I just wow. remember when he died. It was like right during COVID. And I thought to myself, like, from a worldly standpoint, and actually from a family standpoint, that guy did a lot of good stuff. I mean, Absolutely. I know he also made some mistakes, but he Absolutely. also about redemption, his story of like forgiveness. He yes. had a, a confessor he met with every week that he walked through after he made his mistakes. Mm. And I respect that a lot. And this guy dies and you ask yourself, you know, and he was giving, right? He was doing yeah. kid camps and yeah. all sorts of stuff. Like what comes with you after that? Because nobody in his family could care less about money when Kobe's right. gone, right? right? And same with Lee. It's You want that time, you want that heartbeat, you want that moment. Yes. Um, yes. Gosh, I paint powerful. his portrait. Really, Colby's. In fact, I'll, I'll be painting it tomorrow. Um, I'll be painting it for the kids. Yeah, you're going to be giving a talk at the Highland School to the kids, yeah. and then you're going to be doing one for the adults. Yes. Uh, tomorrow evening, a formation yeah. night. Have you ever done Kobe and Colbe together? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, Saint I have Max not. Saint Maximilian Colby. <laughs> What's his, what's his uh, they call him the, the viper, the, what do they call oh, him? Oh, the, the mamba? The mamba. Mamba, <laughs> mamba, yeah, mamba. Saint Maximilian Mamba. <laughs> uh, I don't, th I think this is blasphemous now. Yeah, pro well. Yeah. <laughs> no, for Colby. Colby's a patron saint of our show. In fact, yeah. here's a little statue. Oh, Colby look at right that. Here. We don't <laughs> have the dunking Colby. We have the, uh, the monkey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Oh, that was Yo. good. <laughs> Um, man, where to go? I have so many questions, but I feel like we will be doing ourselves a disservice if we don't play a quick little game. And we're going to come back. We're going to keep going on your stuff. We're not going to do all of our goofy stuff, but we're going to play a quick game for you because you feel like a guy who's ready to judge some crazy. Just okay. a game called Blessed Are the Joke Makers, okay. for they shall inherit the points. This one's going to be 260 points. This is a big one. One point Whoa. for every page in your book. Wow. And Tom, you know you're the judge. You've heard the show before. Pick yes. I something. really need a comeback here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so yes, so we've got a character card and a Catholic card game card, and we have to answer the Catholic card game prompt, and that can be a fill-in-the-blank or a question or something as the character. So we don't know what either of these are. How uh, are you feeling about it? I feel, I feel okay. You look really nervous. I'm feeling strong. <laughs> You're just trying to get in my head. You're feeling strong? <laughs> oh, yeah. I feel like when you make big point totals, you know that there's some juju going on. 
I don't know anything about juju, but I know <laughs> you. I'm you ready. Knew you. <laughs> All right, and so, again, we have to answer the prompt as the character, and you just get to decide which one tickled your funny bone. That's, okay. that's all, all right. that it boils down to. So here we go. As a spoiled, rotten kid, I got seven deadly sins, but blank <laughs> ain't one. <laughs> Ever since my parents got this new Tesla, I just take it cruising because I put it on autopilot. And uh, I know I'm only 14, but I got seven deadly sins, and driving without a license ain't one. I actually got a, in a lot of trouble for driving without a license. <laughs> <laughs> Personal story. Nice. <laughs> Man, I'm the quarterback of the football team. I'm, you know, prom king, and I obviously am, you know, dating the most beautiful girl in high school. But, you know, my parents decided to get rid of all the mirrors in the house, and I, I'm not even allowed to have portraits of myself anymore because I got seven deadly sins, but vanity ain't one. Well played into the guest. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> uh, and I've spent the last eight hours doing engineering work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cutting that. <laughs> yeah, um... Uh, as a you know, as a as a kid who's well taken care of, but uh, has never encountered a billionaire or anything like that, um, I I would just like to say I got seven deadly sins, but but envy isn't one. Seriously, it's not one of the sins. I promise, promise it's not envy. Um, also, it's not lying. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, what say you on the game? Oh gosh. You guys are all great. Well, that's um, very nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's what he circled in here. He yeah, said, you I'm, are amazing. You are amazing. Got that. Now you still have to Thank pick you. a winner. I'm going to go with Paul. Yeah! Oh, wow. yeah. I'm going to go with Paul. Adversity. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Paul's going to get a very special <laughs> shout-out for the kids. Stop the attitude! <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> that's amazing. My kids' biggest idols are Nick and Paul. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very strange house it's I live in. So funny. <laughs> for being our celebrity guest judge today, Tom, and for even giving points to the point leader already, you're going to get a very special pair of socks from SockReligious.com. These are St. Monica socks. I think you're really mm -hmm. going to love these. Uh, patron saint of wayward children and patience. Oh, wow. And uh, I think That's that great. this is you going and speaking to the high schools and to the kids and bringing them back in. If you Beatitudes want your own Sock Religious Socks, Amen. Amen. go to SockReligious.com slash Beatitudes. And we're going to see you right after the break. God bless. Hey, y'all. This is Jeff Shufflebein. When Nick and I set out to start our new company, Undivided Life, we were really concerned about how would we cover the health care needs of our growing families. And we were so excited to find a company that fit both our medical needs and our faith beliefs perfectly. It's called Solidarity HealthShare. It is an ethical alternative to traditional health insurance. We're never part of sharing in the medical costs of anything that goes against the teachings of the Catholic Church, making it a great alternative for Catholics and Christians alike. Solidarity is very affordable, which is perfect for a large family or for a new and growing business like the one we've started. So visit joinsolidarity.com today so that you can get started with us. The team at Aquinas Wealth Advisors believes that good values and good returns are not mutually exclusive. Using a tech-smart and morally sound approach, they provide investment alternatives that align with Catholic teachings without sacrificing returns. These days, faith-driven investors are finding it hard to know where their money is going. They have no visibility into what their dollars are supporting, but there's a better way. Thanks to the faith and finance score from Aquinas Wealth Advisors, you can look into your current holdings to see what you're supporting and make a switch to an advisor that aligns with your values and gives power to your voice. Check out AquinasWealth.com today. Hi, it's Paul Kolker from the Beatitudes here, and I just wanted to share with you guys that I also, outside of the show, perform improv comedy on a regular basis with a group called Divine Comedy. 
So what we do is we come up with everything on the spot. So whether you're looking for faith-filled, fun, family-friendly comedy for your youth night or whether you're looking for clean comedy for your corporate event, Divine Comedy can perform for your group and even get you in on the action. So if you'd like to hire us to come out and perform for your next event, check out DivineComedyImprov.com. Divine Comedy, an inferno of fun. Ooh, welcome back, everybody. <laughs> we are here with Tom Verano talking about Mordor. You got to hear break. what Paul just said. <laughs> We're talking about Jeff. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> During a quick break, we were discussing the ring that Tom gave and then received. <laughs> Jeff makes a comment about the Lord of the Rings. And I, Mordor. I mentioned Mordor, and Paul, Paul says, says... That's when you have too few windows. Because you have... Mordor. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Grand Slam. <laughs> From an under-the-breath comment... <laughs> Just hey, he, pulling it out. He got 260 points. He's like Man. just rubbing it in. Yeah. I feel good. <laughs> Eight hours of engineering work later. <laughs> <laughs> I just leaned into the nerd so part. So good. <laughs> so good. So <laughs> good. Oh. Anyways, uh, Tom, I want to hear more about your story. So you get this ring back. You're still attending Protestant, non-denom- non-denominational yeah. church of some kind. Yep. And then... That's not your current status. You are Catholic yes. yet again. So yes. what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, being at the non-denominational church, it was, uh, we were there, my wife and I were there for 13 years. And it was, it was an amazing time in the fact that we were taught so much as far as how to, how to study, how to, you know, Crack open your Bible and prayer time and, um, you know, listening to, you know, worship music and all of that. But there was something missing and we didn't know what it was. We really we just knew that something was missing. And then we fast forward our lives. Um, We ended up uh, and of course, it's all in the book, but we've we ended up uh, moving. We moved to Florida and had a horrific business experience there. By this time, Lee has passed, um, so I didn't have him to fall back on, and we had a really horrible business experience that literally shook me to my core. I mean, I'm on my knees, like, now what, Lord? And um, we had theft in our company, and so we had to move back to New York and move back into an apartment above my portrait studio. I happened to own that building, and we're my my little family and I have two daughters and and of course my wife and we're living above the portrait studio and I'm I'm literally starting over, like mm. thirty plus years as a portrait photographer. Everything, I lost everything and I'm starting over. And in that time, I'm literally weeping. I had suicidal thoughts. You know, I, I I was just confused. I was like, Lord, why? I, I didn't understand. I And in that time, it's when my wife, in her prayer time, ended up coming across Word on Fire with Bishop Barron. And she said, honey, check this out. And we watched Catholicism series for the first time. And it changed our whole life changed our whole walk, changed everything. We found formed w- with Chris Stefanik and the crew, changed everything for us. And I'm literally in my prayer time, I'm like, Lord, now what? And I was at a Best Buy, you know, Best Buy where mm-hmm. electronics. I'm at a mm-hmm. Best Buy, I'm looking at camera stuff. And a gentleman walked up to me. He was a, a past client. I used to photograph his family portraits and all that. And he said, Tom, have you ever painted before? And I said, no, I, I don't like being dirty. I wear a tuxedo. <laughs> I like things crisp, you know. I don't even help my wife paint the walls in our home. He said, <laughs> "He said, well, well, wait a minute, watch this video. And it was a gentleman, YouTube video of a gentleman by the name of Denny Dent. He's deceased now, but he was painting really fast. He had paint in his hair, rock and roll music. He's throwing paint. As soon as I saw this, the same passion 
that hit me when went with my camera that my father gave me at 14 years old hit me with brushes. I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm wow. going to change my life wow. and I'm going to be a portrait. I'm going to be a painter. <laughs> that's I'm going to do this. So that night I went home and like I said, we lived above our portrait studio and I went home and I had a canvas set up. And I, after dinner, I called my, my family downstairs into the studio area, and I said, watch this. And they came down, got situated, I turned on the music, started painting really fast, and I flipped it over, and there was silence in the room because it did not come out. It, it just didn't come out. My, my teenage daughters are looking at me like I lost my mind. <laughs> oh, no. And uh, my wife comes over to the canvas and she said, honey, maybe if you tried this, or did, it wasn't helping, it didn't come out. And I'm standing there with my head down and I'm like, Lord, but you, you said that I can do this. You know, in my heart, I, I thought I can do this. And then instantly, my heart was, my mind was brought to the fact that it took me decades to become a professional photographer. Decades. Study, practice, alone time, books, all of it. And here I am going to step into a studio, never painted before, ever. And I'm going to just create this canvas it wasn't happening. So I went down there for four more months by myself in that studio. And I was destroying my beautiful portrait studio. Gorgeous. I mean, tens of thousands of people came through the studio. It was like the studio to go to. And I was destroying the studio. I had, I had paint on the walls, on my equipment, on the hardwood floors. So I called a friend who works with brick and mortar. His name is Angelo. He's, an, he's a mason. And I said, Angelo, come on over to the studio, man. I need your help. 100-year-old building. We go down in the basement and dirt floor and we dug out four ton of rock and dirt out of the basement and then we poured concrete and then poured stairs and I had a painting pit in my basement and I went down there for three more months by myself without my family, nobody, and I just painted over and over and over again and then I called my girls down again and my teenage daughters reluctantly came down dad it's annoying it doesn't come out just one more time just just let me show you this one more time they came down situated themselves I turned on the music painted really fast flipped it over and I got it and it came out my wife came over to the canvas and started crying she said honey you just taught our daughters that if you put your heart into anything that you want you can do and achieve whatever it is that you want to do and that's what I'm out there telling these students in K through 12 schools nationally. I'm, I'm, I'm standing before them and saying, there's a purpose for your life. There's something written. God has molded you. He's created you. Ephesians 2.10 says you are a masterpiece and he has something special for your life. And I'm trying to get that through to them. Religious or not, I'm trying to get that through to their hearts to say that you are seen and you are special. And to go back to your question, Nick, it was then, at that moment that my wife introduced me to Bishop Barron, that we started studying under Bishop Barron, we started studying things that we've never heard before in such a way. And it exposed this truth to us that we've never encountered in any other setting in a church before, mm. was, uh, all I could say is just it just resonated with my wife became an adult convert. I actually and my my daughters became Catholic um, that year, and I was actually able to walk through the um, the classes with them. I yeah. went to all the classes with them, and and we we have never looked back. I mean, it, it's like my wife and I are our relationship with Christ is the pinnacle. It's the pinnacle for us, and that's. What I love about this show, guys, is because people know they need to know the truth. Yeah. They need to they need to have that relationship with God to overcome. And I have a gift for you guys. It's going to be the smallest gift that you've ever gotten on this show. Are you ready? Is it a ring? Nope. Okay. It's not a ring. It's the smallest gift that you've okay. ever gotten. That's for you. you take what? That. You take that. It's a tiny bottle. And inside the bottle... Jesus said, if you have faith as big as a mustard seed, <laughs> that you can move mountains and problems in your life. There that's a mustard seed right there. 
And he said that to us. I mean, think about that. We can move mountains and problems in our life. That's so cool. Isn't that incredible? That is great. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll pause there. Well, <laughs> well, I'm coming right back to you. First of all, very cool gift. Probably going to be the greatest Easter egg behind us because people would be like, wait, is there something on the bookshelf? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, but it's the biggest gift because it's faith. And so Amen. here, <laughs> I would have never imagined in the story that you share <laughs> that you have, that you didn't grow up painting. Like I thought there was like this other like love in this parallel path you came into this in inspiration and in adulthood um paul do you want to share what's in your (laughs) (laughs) i'm sorry i just love that we keep getting bottles of things but (laughs) we have a huge bottle with a rubik's cube in it from giancarlo bernini a magic trick from a magic trick and he's actually (laughs) an illusion trick it's well yes it's an illusion (laughs) but he's uh He's going back on um, Penn and Teller's Fool. He got it. Yeah, he got it. He's amazing. Yeah. I know him. Do you know he yeah. recorded his demo for that in our studio? Oh, that's right. Yeah. I oh, forgot he did. <laughs> Welcome, Joe Carlo. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> but I just love that we have these like two bottles that capture that's right. beautiful moments, but in their own way. And that's, that's just incredible. It's like, uh, Jaws, so we're going to need a bigger bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Tom, do, you keep saying this, like, and then I flipped it around. When did you come up with this idea that you're going to paint and music's playing and you're all high energy, okay. and then you flip it over and everybody's like, what? It's a great question. From upside down? You yeah. Know, yeah. When, when I went back to the Catholic Church, the one thing that I realized that the Catholic Church is big on in its service, it's out there serving people. So alongside running my portrait studio, I ran a basketball ministry. And I just, nobody had this idea. I just, you know, we just started this thing. And this, basically, we, we got a gym, a high school gym, and we, we invited guys 16 and up to come off the streets and, and play basketball. The only requirement was they had to do a 10-minute devotional with us before the games. Yeah. And it got me comfortable speaking to people. Ran that for 20 years. Wow. Every Sunday, 20 years, <laughs> met so many people, so many lives were touched and changed. And then as soon as I developed this painting study, I merged the two. And now I'm in schools. Now I'm in corporate events. Now I'm in charity events doing this and just trying to get a message out there of following your dreams, living with passion, going all in like Kobe Bryant. I talk about Kobe Bryant. Amazing, amazing person, went all in. All the people I paint, and I only paint famous faces, they all had a message of putting it all on the table. They didn't deviate. They didn't sway from the left or the right. They put it all on the table and put their whole heart and soul into it. And that's what we need to do. That's what our kids need to do. They need to find their purpose, their identity, that Christ created them for, that God created them for, and put their whole life into that and change this world. That's the power that that our kids are so powerful. Yeah. Mm. Our kids are so powerful that they can move mountains with their faith because there's nothing hindering them. There's, they don't have that blockage that we as adults have. That's why Jesus said to enter the, to the kingdom of heaven, we have to have faith like a child to not have those blockages, you know. So so my wife is the president of the parents club at the school, the Highland School across the street. And thanks be to God that she booked you to be the speaker for that school tomorrow oh, so, so that we can have you on the Beatitudes. But I can't wait for my children to experience your message tomorrow, for my nice. wife to be around the community. I have to fly off. I'm sorry. You, you get me in the tiny table. But um, I want to tell you this. I think you actually know this. We uh, invest in family time about, you know, it's like the priority of faith, spouse, kids, but it all happens around the table, right? So we had a table made, the table has these like inscriptions in about what I love about you and a Bible verse, but the one piece of art we allow to be over our giant table is the one you did of the Mm. Holy Family, because we want the Holy Family to be the model for us. So my kids know who you are already. We talk about you and even how amazing it is that you're painting, flipping, wowing, and I had no idea that you just went in a basement, dug it out, and said, <laughs> Did it for seven Here weeks. It goes. <laughs> See you in a few months. Amen. Amen. Do you do That's anything for a short amount of time, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> 20 years. You're right. from about, you're like, 
I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but these pieces, they take, you know, seven, five, five to seven minutes to create. And there's always a message, you know, whether I'm painting MLK or, you know, one of the saints, Mother Teresa, I talk about her life. And so even in secular schools, I talk about Mother Teresa's life and not that she was doing what she did to turn everyone Catholic. She was doing what she did to love people. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? She was a she was just this 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 powerhouse at five foot tall going out loving people. You know, most of us we see a, a homeless person on the street and we don't know what to do. We you know, do we feed them? Do we give them some money? Do we pat them on the back? And you know, what do we do? She had a plan. She went to a foreign country didn't even know the language and she gets in front of these people in these dangerous places and she scoops these people up that were dying on the streets that their families kicked them out of their homes because of their illness they didn't want to get that on themselves kick them out and they're on the streets dying and she scoops them up and takes them home to a place that she created for them to die with dignity that's what I'm trying to get through this this compassion this empathy for our kids. We're losing that in this country, and we're losing empathy and, and compassion. So mm. anyway, I'm on a mission. I think I'm it was our mission. guest, Jonathan Doyle, the, Aust- the first Australian, that told the story of like all these great things we can do, but think about the witness of Mother Teresa and the folks around her that would look someone in the eyes and smile at them as they were dying so that their last view of something mm. on mm. earth was a face of loving kindness Amen. Amen. and isn't that mm. to be seen as as important if not more important than all the things we think we're doing with our donations and our big money you know like those things are important too so i don't want to knock it but i'm just yes. saying everybody has a place to play you know right around the corner from the studio there's a group called finding calcutta ministries and the gentleman who runs it gets people together 50 people at a time every all over town, different pockets every single Saturday for works of corporal mercy, especially with the homeless. And then they do a trip to Calcutta once a year. It is really cool to watch the heart Hmm. of what he is helping people to come to because most people are like, I want to help, but I don't know what to do. He's like, well, cool. Just show up here. This parking lot. I got all this stuff lined up for us. Let's go. Um, So anyways, I just like to plug all of our our friends doing great work too. It's awesome. You're one of them. Hey, um, we're going to give you a a minute here to uh, to maybe give a final thought. And I, I even think you have a unique perspective to share about how can how can how can people be of better service or better loving care to recognize that the wounds of others that you know there's this grace to give to people when they're going through times that we may not know where it came from I'm mean, wherever you kind of want to go with this but first I want to go back to the website anybody who wants to check this out go to emotion into art.com nailed it <laughs> I, I can actually read dudes that was good um and I also just want to encourage people, we're going to be talking about your actual presentations on the bonus show. And so when we get to that, um, that's actually where we're going to do our reverse Simpsons as well, which is a totally different way to d- approach this week. But see how that works? It works. It is a reverse Simpsons. It still Simpsons. works. Yep. <laughs> what, um, for closing thoughts for our audience today, as we kind of get out of here, Mike's all yours. What would you w- leave us with as you uh, inspire others, love others, or even challenge us? I would say... You know, I wrote down a couple notes, but um, the one thing that resonates with me is in the scriptures, there's three people that we all know, Paul, Barnabas, and Timothy, right? Paul, somebody we look up to, we gain wisdom from. That's our Paul, right? Barnabas, somebody we walk with that sees every part of our life, that intimacy into me, see, they see that. Mm. And then a Timothy is somebody we reach down and pull up into a greater story. And I think, especially as men, especially as men, if we have those three men in our lives at all times, I believe that we have the possibilities to change this world forever because we're, we're sowing into the next generation, okay? And... There are a tremendous amount of, I've been doing this now for 12 years, and there's so many hurting people out there. They, they approach the stage weeping. They're broken. They're not being seen. 
And you and I at this table know what they're missing. We know what they're missing. They're not going to find it in the stuff. You know, Lee, when I met Lee, he was making 250000 a month. That's at 93. That's $3 million a year. He lived in the same house he raised his, his sons in. He drove a Toyota. He didn't have luxury anything. I went to his home multiple times from the city. I'd, I'd go home with him on the trains, and we'd have dinner, him and his wife and, and myself. They did not live in luxury at all. And I asked him, I said, Lee, why don't you have the stuff? Why don't you have the Lamborghini? Why don't you have... And he said, Tom, if I had all that, I wouldn't be able to help people like you. His perspective was out of this world. Yeah. It was out of this world. And he knew that he wasn't going to be here forever. And none of us, we've heard this, none of us are taking any of this with us. You know, we're, we're striving and going after all this stuff. And none of it's coming with us, but we still keep doing it. We still treat, you know, try to gain all this stuff, build bigger barns and all that. And we're never going to see a hearse pulling at you all. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's just not going to happen. So love people and try to get over. I'm reading a book right now. It's called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. Some of my biggest challenges in life are is overcoming wounds that people have done to me. Yeah. When you expose yourself to people, you are vulnerable to get hurt. And um, so I'm trying to overcome that. So that's my closing thought. What a beautiful show. I know this is a powerful one, one that we will be revisiting um, and also sharing because I think a lot of men need to hear this. So thank you for your witness, your vulnerability, and your work. Thank you. Yeah, we will see you on the blank canvas of life. And for the rest of you, we will see, see you in the Eucharist. God bless us all. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to join us at our undersized table, subscribe to the video version of the show on YouTube by typing at, that's the symbol at, so shift and two on your keyboard, at the underscore Beatitudes on YouTube. We'll see you there. This podcast is part of the Spoke Street Network. For more great podcasts, visit Spokestreet.com.